The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. The most surprising thing about the 2018 Philly season is the feeling of profound disappointment diehard fans are feeling now that the postseason is here and our fightings are not in it. To be sure, none of us could have predicted at the beginning of the season that the Phils even had a shot at a wild card. But the Phillies and rookie manager Gabe Kapler surprised us when we looked at the standings on August the 5th and found the Fightins 15 games over 500 and atop the National League's Eastern Division by one and a half games. It sure seemed as if the Phillies would make the postseason for the first time in seven years. Instead, the Fightins imploded, going 15 and 28 down the stretch, finishing third with a record of 80 wins and 82 losses, 10 games out, and handing the NL East to the Atlanta Braves. And that's why the last six weeks of the season have been so bitterly disappointing. What exactly happened to the Phils? Here to help us figure that out is my guest, Howie Bedell, a former player, manager, and executive with the Phillies organization. Howie began his Major League Baseball career with the Milwaukee Braves in 1962 and ended it with the Phillies in 1968. Afterwards, he coached and managed in the Phillies farm system until 1980 when he was promoted to farm director. Howie had a special ability as a teacher coach that allowed him to cultivate cultivate Major League talent. During his tenure, the Phillies developed such players as Marty Bystrom, Randy Lurch, Keith Moreland, Lonnie Smith, and Bob Walk, all of whom played instrumental roles in winning the Phillies' first world championship in 1980. Of course, Ryan Sandberg, who went on to the Hall of Fame uh, with the Chicago Cubs, was another of Bedell's protégés. Wherever Howie landed after Philadelphia, the organization he joined captured a World Series. It happened in 1985 with the Kansas City Royals, where he served as coordinator of field instruction and bench coach, and in 1990 with the Cincinnati Reds, where he served as Director of Player Development. Howie is a baseball insider, a man who has always worked behind the scenes, but whose contributions to the Phillies and to the game itself have been critical to their success. Welcome back to the podcast, Howie. Thanks, Bill. Good to be with you. Howie, we're going to address several topics this evening. But let's just begin with the last six weeks of the season, which were so disappointing. In a nutshell, what happened to the Phillies? <laughs> well, I, that, that's a really a $64,000 question. Uh, uh, from the point of view of understanding how a team was able to have uh, the kind of success it had early on, and basically 80% of the, the season – uh, it makes it very difficult for even those of us who've been in the game all our lives to understand exactly uh, what 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 really went wrong those last six weeks. I will say this to you that uh, uh, I've seen some of this before in other organizations that I've participated, particularly early on. Uh, there there really seems to be a heartfelt feeling about. Uh, this this Philly team and and of course where it was and prior to this year uh, they were really struggling to have the kind of success that Philadelphia is accustomed to. Having said all that, it does take quite a change. And in all fairness to uh, Lee McPhail and Gabe Kapler and and, uh, and others uh, who made the decision to do what they did with the ball club this year, they've made a complete right turn. There's no question about that as far as personnel on the field, where those individuals have played before, how much experience they had. And, of course, then they put a manager in a position to have to deal with kind this kind of a, an uptight. And not easy any easy chore for not only the team as a whole, but for Gabe as an individual. And, uh, of course, 
he stands out front. He has to take uh, both the good and the bad with what happened this year. And in all in all fairness to him personally, and having held this kind of a position early on, uh, he battled and and had to had to explain himself many many times. Uh, I don't believe Gabe's the problem here, as far as when you you look at it as a baseball person uh, in accomplishing the goal that. Philadelphia has grown to desire each and every year, and that has, is to have a successful ending to a, a baseball season. We have so many diehard fans and loyal fans in Philadelphia that not only enjoy good baseball but look to be successful when it comes this time of the year. Well, Howie, let's let's look at Kaplow. I'm I'm glad you you know you you cited him because. For better and worse, uh, he was really kind of the lightning rod to this season. Um, now, certainly, Kapler's upbeat, positive approach to the game and what it seems to be his unconditional support for the players inspired a strong team chemistry. And it also also gave confidence to budding young stars like Reese Hoskins and Aaron Nola. Um he also brought, uh, as we know, an analytics-based approach to the Phillies, a club which once actively distanced itself from the new metrics. Now, at the same time, uh, Kapler also learned that an analytics-based approach cannot be the sole factor in determining a batting order, mm-hmm. how to use the bullpen, or where to play a fielder. Mm-hmm. Experience, intuition, and the traditional evaluation of players is, as we know, every bit as important. So, so Howie, let me ask you, in what ways does Gabe Kapler still have to improve in order to be successful in guiding this team to a postseason berth in the future? Well, Bill, I'm not, I'm not in that clubhouse every day, and I don't know the man personally, but there's, there's a certain persona that a manager takes uh, when he runs and operates his ball club. And uh, you've got to give him, you know, a strong kudos for his uh, his ability to stick to his guns and recite when uh, everything is failing around him or doesn't go well. He sticks to the mantra, dealing with analytics, and we we knew this was going to happen, and we knew that was going to happen. The truth of the matter is, and I've been in, I've been at the upper levels, both on the field and off the field. And if anyone is so clairvoyant that they can give those answers and stand by them day by day, they've either lost themselves in the game itself and or their aspirations of being a success. I I just feel that he's got to be more realistic. This This is an outsider's approach at this point, but a baseball opinion got to be more realistic about his team, what they are able to do and what they're not able to do, and of course, when it comes time to do it, that that individual has the talent to be able to do it more than not. Baseball is a game of percentages. There's absolutely no question about that. Analytics have played a super role in, in all baseball teams, regardless of how you speak about it, it's, it's a numbers game, it's a, a successful game, uh, but how do we explain the 25th man on the ball club stepping up in the 10th inning when there's no one left to hit a home run and win your ball game? There's no way to explain that, none whatsoever. The other difference in relationship to moving people around in the lineup as, as he did all year, that can be discerning for a ball club in and of itself. The lack of being able to, to settle on a lineup as early possible, as early as possible, to have continuity and so that the player in and of himself knows his responsibility day in and day out. Now, analytics will tell us that certain people strike out against certain people. Pitchers do certain things against certain hitters. Those things are all well and good. But at the same time, I've not necessarily ever believed 
that we can rely totally on what those numbers show us for, as I say, in any given game, at any given time, that 25-man roster is being used and has the ability to be successful. I'm I'm glad you said that because I think many fans made this last season a referendum on Kapler's analytics-based approach to the game, Um, and and I don't think that was fair. Um, On on the other hand, I don't know if an 80 and 82 record is an accurate reflection of the success or the failure of, of analytics. Um, but I, I like what you said. I mean, you really do need a a combination of the traditional evaluative me- uh, methods, knowing your players, know what their capability is, um, because one of the things he's been criticized for is playing players out of position. Now, the other thing that is interesting to me uh, and, and I don't know because I don't know what he's like in, in the clubhouse. You know, he could be a tyrant in the clubhouse. Maybe, you know, what, what we see uh, and hear uh, on TV or on, uh, on the radio is a, a very positive, upbeat person. And he could be reading the riot act to people like Herrera when they don't run out of ground ball. I don't know. Um, I also don't know to what degree – he is taking advantage of the wisdom that surrounds the Phillies. And, and, and let me be specific here. Um, you got some former players, particularly from that 1980 ball club, uh, and at least one from the 93 ball club, John Cruck, who were attached to the club. Larry Boa, who's an advisor to Matt Klintak, works primarily with minor leaguers. But clearly, one of his strengths is working with young players. And I'm, maybe he has, but I haven't heard him working with Scott Kingery, who's a middle infielder, and he struggled in Philadelphia after very limited AAA experience. And I think that Kingery could have benefited this year from working consistently with Boa, who, as you know, was a gold glove shortstop. Um, let me take another example, and this applies to John Cruck and Mike Schmidt. The Phillies were ranked by Fox Sports 23rd out of the 30 MLB teams and 22nd by ESPN in terms of their hitting. The team batting average this season was 234. The slugging average was 393. On base percentage was 314 and an OPS of 707. They're pretty anemic numbers. And it seems like John Malley, the Phillies hitting coach, had his hands full. So why didn't Kapler ask Mike Schmidt, who was around for every weekend home series, to give a a, a regular tutorial or or to work with the younger players? I I know he didn't. I mean, Mike said that last week on on the the podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, And why wasn't John Crock asked? I mean, for crying out loud, even Greg Luzinski could talk to some of these young sluggers uh, 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 about power hitting. And yet we hear that general manager Matt Klintak just fired virtually all of the Phillies minor league hitting instructors because he wants a selective, aggressive approach at the plate, an approach that emphasizes more discipline to draw walks and more line drives instead of ground balls. Well, who better to coach that style than a, 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 you know, a guy like John Crook and Mike Schmidt, who's a Hall of Famer? Yeah. Well, um, you're, 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 t- you're, touching on so- you're touching on something that uh, really gets to the core of the question. In other words, who is being asked to participate and teach and be with these players? Now, the, all those players that you mentioned, uh, I either spent time with them in the minor leagues early on, been around them at the major league level and so forth and they are all credible in their own right to be able to do the kind of things that baseball asks us to do and to get involved now i don't know that they weren't they were asked they weren't asked uh i would assume if 
from listening to Kruk on, on the air and to hear Schmidt from time to time when I'm around him, and even Bo, even Larry, that uh, they were not uh, quizzed as often as possible might have been possible at a time. At a time. Now I'm not saying that. I, I think if you took a good look and the fans took a look, good look at spring training, they were there in spring training for the most part. They they were around and and uh, probably the players had some access to them. But it's it's always a matter th- having that kind of talent uh, available is always predicated on the the ability of leadership to uh, engage them. And if if they're not necessarily engaged, uh, oftentimes, and particularly a club that uh, like this one with its makeup and with a new manager, uh, it just doesn't happen. You might see them there and so forth and so on. And again, we we don't know how much uh, what involvement uh, after spring training may t- have taken place. Uh, in spring training, you can visibly see it. They're there in the ball. They're in the ballpark. They're sitting on the bench. They're spending time at, in the training area. And, and when they're they're working out. So there may have been some of that early on, but uh, you, you've touched on something I think that's very very important. When you have veterans of that nature in your organization, and Philadelphia has has uh, double handfuls available still living by the way and have enough have enough ability to be able to pass that on it is it is not in the best interest and the success of the Philly organization not to utilize that talent let me let me look at this maybe from another way too and and uh i i know i know Gabe Kapler has been criticized as being arrogant uh thinking his way is the way to do things and so has Klintak. Uh I'm not going to go that far. But what I will say is that these guys are millennials. They came of age at the turn of the century. Um, and I've seen the same trend in education and in journalism. Millennials don't ask for mentorship. Mm-hmm. They tend to think that they can handle things, that, mm-hmm. that, that seeking wisdom from members of a previous generation is a sign of weakness. Uh, and, and frankly, Howie, that attitude, in my estimation, is also driving the analytics-based approach to the game. Now, Bill James might have started this with sabermetrics, but the people that have taken over are all from that millennial generation. And you see the same type of resistance, and, it, and it's funny almost because – there was a resistance to accept analytics. Well, now it seems there's a resistance from this new generation of manager, young managers and general managers to accept the old ways of doing things. And I, I, I just I, I don't see that as healthy. I mean, I don't even see that as common sense. No, and I, and I think you, you make a good point. Uh, we, we have an entirely different group I always call them players within the organization. And I've spoken to some of the coaches in the minor leagues, and they have been asked some two or three years ago to work with the the analytics and the numbers and so forth and so on to be able to uh, maneuver and move this uh, thought process through the organization. Now, uh, one individual explained to me that, uh, they were asked two or three years ago to start this, and he's a, he's of been in the organization many years. And he said the, the amount of resistance from the people that were being asked was minimal for one reason: if they objected, they were going to be fired. And mm-hmm. baseball people at those levels don't like those kind of challenges for the simple reason that. They do their jobs very well, and they've been doing them for years, and, and not, not necessarily are, are they perfect. And I've spent time on both sides of this, Bill, and it's, it's evident. Uh, by my, I know my personal experience in, in three or four organizations that if uh, there's any reluctance to follow a, a certain decision that's made in relationship to conduct on the field that has to do with teaching procedures and so forth, 
uh, that individual is is chastised greatly, wow. uh, often silently, and 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 eventually a firing. And wow. uh, I, I think this is a a point that you, you've touched on. Uh, the the younger player coming along has no idea about all this. For the most part, they're leaving very progressive programs that they've been, that they've been drafted uh, from, and, and and what they're trying to do is uh, get over the excitement of the first couple of years of their careers and do what the organization asks them to do and to play the kind of baseball that they have the ability to play at that particular moment. So there's there's so much goes into this, both physical and mental, and uh, when you get back to Gabe, for example, to uh, – I mean, I've observed him more or less uh, at a distance, and he defies. He defies with his uh, body language, his fingers in his belt loops, his standing on the upper steps of the dugout. He defies what's happening on the field. Uh, that's my, that's my take on this, and I believe I believe the players, for the most part, and I'm not there, must just go on with their business. And after a while, that just becomes part of the everyday uh, procedure so they they don't they don't react to whatever has to happen now you don't have to tear the clubhouse down when you lose a game um, turn tables over and so forth I mean I've been a part of the Gene Mock era uh, been part of uh, the Kansas City situation as well and and uh, Lou Pinello was uh, <laughs> we went we were in first place all year and won that pennant in Cincinnati and uh, uh, and I and I've watched him get nervous when, when we're only two games up, <laughs> and coming up to the front office with with Bob Quinn and myself, and saying, "I need another player. I need a left-handed hitter to hit a, against a right-handed pitcher in, in the eighth inning." I mean, it was ridiculous. Some of the stuff that that managers and players actually go through, both mentally and physically. Uh, I've seen it, and well, I'm sure. That, 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 let, let, let me let me just say one more thing about Kapler because we got a whole bunch of other issues that we have to address, and 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 I know you'll appreciate this because you were a teacher coach. I mean, yeah. a great example. I mean, you like guys like you and John Vukovic don't come around very often. I mean, just pure teacher coaches, um, you know, who really did care about the players as as people as well as their performance on the field. And, and and I gotta be honest with Kapler, and again, as we both said, we don't know what goes on behind the scenes. But I think both of his parents are teachers. Uh the guy's well read. Um and yet sometimes I wonder if this constant, upbeat, positive, non-critical approach is really good for the players. There's a wonderful book that just came out. The name of the author escapes me, but it's called The Coddling of the American Mind. And we're seeing this in higher education today, too. Mm -hmm. And what the argument is, is that the generation of, of, of youngsters coming of age right now are being coddled. You know, they're they're not being told straight up, you know, when they need to be made accountable uh, or are even made accountable, they're not, they're not being reasoned with or told flat out, look, you're not making the mark. And it seems to me when you allow guys like um, Odebol Herrera and, and uh, Michael Franco to swing from the, you know, the, the heels – on every pitch, uh, and just you know, try to hit the ball out of the park. I mean, my God, they're the, they're the two most undisciplined hitters I have ever seen. And you keep on trotting them out there and coddling them, frankly. Now, I realize Franco was benched for a period of time, uh, and probably if they could have traded him at the deadline, he would be gone. But still, uh, you know, a guy like um, Scott Tingry, I mean, he was trotted out there to shortstop before they got uh, Cabrera. I mean, is it really doing these guys much good if they're really not being benched or, or made accountable for it? And, well, and I think, once again, this is just part of this coddling 
of of young people. And I don't I don't see. I mean, when I coach, I am very frank with. And granted, I do this at the high school level, but I tell my players, you're not cutting it. You're going to sit. And if you don't hold up the standard or maintain the standard, you're going to sit. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I, I do praise them, you know, mm-hmm. just as hard. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that even balance is, is being given to these, these, these young kids on the Phillies. Well, the, the def, def, in deference to what you've just said and, and, and everything that we see and we, we're able to observe, uh, there's, there's, and you mentioned a couple of players, for example, uh, ex- very little discipline at the plate, and we, we all understand that that hitting does take a certain amount of discipline. It takes a great deal of talent uh, to handle a 90-plus fastball and a breaking ball in the next pitch. Uh, it truly does that. So that in in developing in developing that type of an individual, both physically and mentally takes a certain amount of patience but you get you get to a, a certain point and and we all do it as parents we do it in our life that you get to a certain point and you say enough is enough and you're probably not too far off the point in relationship to uh, the younger people today and and what we we're asking them to do and and how we're asking them to be successful however the success is still the same. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded what the distance is from the pitcher's mound to home plate hasn't changed. The distance between home plate and around the bases hasn't changed. It's, but guys don't run balls out sometimes. Mm-hmm. And there's other, there's other issues in relationship to, to pitching and, and catching and hitting. But to the, it's the same, it, it, the same result we're looking for, and that's the success with a I mean, they just discovered that the end, the end of the season, the stolen base is important. Now, you tell me. <laughs> I mean, that, that's part of the game. Catch, catching balls and throwing to the right base is part of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we've had, we have individuals that played there this year that, that are not going to, I wouldn't think, be playing in those same positions next year. And, and if they are after this year, then, then the organization really needs to examine itself because so that 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 actually brings up my next point. I, I want to talk about the veterans that Matt Clentak acquired before the season and and during the season and uh, and look at them because there's been a lot of talk that the Phillies started their swoon after the deadline or shortly after the deadline after these veterans were acquired and there's some thinking out there that. Uh, these veterans mess with the chemistry. I don't think that's the case. I think there were many other factors, but uh, it, it's still it's still pretty evident that these guys did not deliver the kind of leadership to the young team that they needed to secure a playoff berth. Jake Arrieta, a former Cy Young Award winner who the Phils signed to a $75 million contract in the offseason, did not provide the consistency needed from a top-of-the-rotation starting pitcher. He went 10-11 and 11 with a 3.96 ERA and 138 strikeouts. Now, I'm not saying Arietta did that. I'm not saying he, he pitched poorly. In fact, he, he was undefeated in July and August. He posted a total of seven of his ten wins during those two months. But he also went 0-4 in June, and he faded in September. He went one and two in five starts. Mm-hmm. The other big uh, free agent acquisition that the Phillies got in the offseason was Carlos Santana. He hit two twenty nine with 24 home runs and 86 RBI while splitting time between first and third. You had Jose Bautista acquired in August from the Mets. He hit two forty four with just two home runs and six RBIs as a part-time outfielder. Trevor Plough. Acquired at the deadline from Tampa Bay, hit 250 with one home run and three RBIs, mostly as a pinch hitter. None of these guys were really very consistent at the plate. Now, having said that, there were two guys who were clearly upgrades at their position. Wilson Ramos, who ended up being the most successful hitter on the team, and shortstop 
Azubal Carrera. Uh, these were clearly upgrades at their positions, but they weren't game changers, star players who can carry a team. In fact, none of these veterans were. They were second choices after Machado fell through. So, how he played general manager, which one ones of, of these guys do you retain for the 2019 season? Well, you got your hands full here because there's, uh, there's uh, at, at first glance, I, I don't want to name names, but there are about three, three or four that you have to say to yourself, how much value do they have as far as the makeup on this ball club and moving forward? Where are they going to play and are they going to play every day? Uh, those questions have to be asked. The management has to ask those questions. And the, and the people that you named that were actually brought about, brought aboard to be able to uh, make the club better really did, didn't contribute for one reason or another. Now, we, we don't know all the, the reasons at this point that they, as we sit here and speak. But we know we know what the contribution was, and we're able to measure it in the manner in which you did. I, I would say I would say to you that that front office needs to be very very busy if they need to duplicate or would want to duplicate, and they do what they did the first half of the year. They're going to have they're going to have to bolster uh, the, the lineup, and, and and let me say something about the uh, about even those who they bring in and, and, and mold. To, to what they're trying to do, the, the idea that you're going to hit a home, you're going to hit 10, 15 home runs as an individual, and when you're going to hit them and hit 210 or or less, does not make a heck of a lot of sense to we veteran baseball people. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. There's absolutely no reason that you can't learn to do certain things at certain times to make yourself a better offensive ball player. If we're talking offense strictly. And I think I think that has to that has to be paramount in Cap's mind this coming year and the organization as a whole. They've already they've already observed you can't get enough people in in the batting order to give you enough runs uh, to do what the 25th man did on one particular game to win a win a game in, in the late innings. Every every man has to contribute. I understand that, but you have to get a set lineup. You have to develop, develop some some continuity and relationship to who's whom is who's going to hit where and and when and in, in using the the interesting portion of the analytics analytics to make the excuse that so and so is going to hit third when he normally hits fifth or he hits sixth when he should be hitting second and bounce those guys all around in relationship to what they're doing and dev- and using that talent. You've got to be a magic person to be able to tell me from the beginning of the season as the general manager and you as a manager, you know that you're going to win more games than you're going to lose. In the I, I, You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And if you look at all those guys that, that came in, uh, I mean, you're stuck with Arietta, but right. of all the other ones, I think you keep the catcher, Wilson Ramos. Uh, you know, because Alfaro is not there yet. Not ready. Knapp is does some nice things, but I don't see him, you know, as 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 splitting time at catcher. I I just don't see it. Um, so you need a veteran presence. Ramos was uh, an all star catcher, but he's about the only guy I see of any worth. Now you you mentioned the the great start that they had at the season, and both of us know that that was due to the starting pitching. Because they they did very well through the part, first part of the season. In fact, me, many of these guys chalked up most of their wins between April and July. Um, the the clear ace of the staff was Aaron Nola, seventeen and six with a two point three seven ERA and two twenty four strikeouts. Eflin eleven and eight with a four point three six ERA. Velasquez went nine and twelve with a four point eight five ERA. And Pavetta, who was very frustrating to watch, seven and fourteen with a four point seven seven ERA. Um, if you look at their records in August and September, they're much less impressive. Nola, for example, went two and three in the month of September with a five point six zero ERA in six starts. If you look at the other starters, 
they faded even earlier. Yeah. Um, I, I have to believe, though, that when we're talking these guys, not Arietta, but when we're talking about these younger pitchers, that some of the decline was based on the fact that they had not thrown as many innings in previous seasons as they did this year. I mean, well, I know you, that, yeah, you're you know that. You know, no one. Yeah, let me interrupt. Hold that thought. You, you, you're right on. You're right on, Bill, because uh, a young pitcher is not accustomed maybe to this long a season, but also the way that they were being utilized. In other words, uh, if we get three innings, if we get four innings, if we get if we get four good innings out of you, that's supposed to be a good start today. And and wow. and, and it's, it, it's really not. Uh, and when you look at Nolan, what, what he did in relationship to his entire season, he just essentially was tired. I, I don't see any, because he was still able to take the ball at the end and do what he did and so forth and so on. But pitchers get very, very tired and if you're, they're utilized in certain, it, it's, it's almost a, I, I look at it as if you only have to run the 50 yard dash and someone puts you in the 100, the 100 to run and you run out of gas in the 70, about the 75 mark and someone runs past you and, and wins the race. That's exactly what, what's going on. These young arms, these young arms need, need to be lengthened. Uh, I think Nolan Ryan once said it when he took over the ball club out west. He said all my – and he was a pitching coach. He said all my pitchers are going nine innings. Here's the ball. I'll try that on. That, you're talking about one of the greats of great. said, mm-hmm. here, here, are the, here are the balls, guys. Well, that lasted about two seasons before management finally fired him, and he went back and, and of course, as you know, he's had a good success owning the, the other ball club in Texas. Mm-hmm. But – you're, you're, you're hearing it from a veteran. I, I would think with War, I, I'm thinking of Warren Spahn and Lou Burdett, who I played with. They, they fought for a four-man starting rotation, and then they, they'd fight Bertie Tebbets every, every, every length of the time they were on to stay out there in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, and then come out and throw with me from the outfield. Now, we don't have guys like that today, and I know people say, well, how are you? You're, 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 you're talking about ancient times. <laughs> it's not. It's not so ancient, and the body the body will react to what you ask it to do. If you if you train it to only run fifty yards, and you have to run a hundred yard dash, as they say, you ain't going to get to the, the finish line number one. So what you have to do is you have to train for the two twenty, or the or the hundred twenty yards, so that when you get to that hundred yard, you still have enough left. And that's what baseball is. It's a long season, and when you Start shortening up this whole muscle content that you're sending out there every day. No matter what the name is, you're not you're not going to get the kind of result that you're looking for. Someone along the way, you have to have a terrific offense to be able to deal with someone that's given up three, four, five runs every game. You, well, I, I think I think you're spot on for the bullpen too. Exactly. Uh, you know, Ka- Kapler. I don't think he ever figured out how to use his relievers. And I'm not just talking about his overuse of the bullpen in that very oh. first series uh, of the season against uh, Atlanta. I mean, look at the way he kept on trotting out Sir Anthony Dominguez in, in August and September to close games when he wasn't that effective. Now, the answer to that would be, well, you know, Hector Naris bit the dust back in April. He couldn't close a game to save his life, and he was supposed to be the closer. Uh, so who did you have? Well, you had Dominguez. But what about a bullpen by committee when Dominguez started blowing saves? I mean, the two the team's top best uh, the two top receivers were Neshek uh, after he came off the DL and Tommy Hunter. You know, why don't you go go to closing by committee? Um, I, I just I just don't get that, and I think Dominguez's problem, as you said, was overuse. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, obviously there are there are other problems with the team. Uh, the defense was terrible. ESPN ranked them 29th defensively. The only team that was worse were the St. Louis Cardinals, um, yeah, which is very surprising to me. Very surprising. Very surprising organization, and they they do a lot of good things, the Cardinals. And but it, it uh, I'm not that that's a surprise to me when I hear you say that. 
but I, I know they had some some difficulty. What it what, what and I think you're pointing to something. Baseball has so many areas that you must deal with early on, not only in in a, in a hundred the the, the the overall season. You must deal with and you must deal with them immediately, and in 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 all candor, many of those things need to be dealt with in your organization, in the minor leagues, and also in the, in spring training as you as you prepare and as an individual running that ball club. He's got to he's got to know something about those individuals and and what they have been through and what they have their capabilities and then plug it into whatever numbers he wishes to use from the point of analytics. And this is this is where our numbers come in, but, Bill, you you have to have a knowledge of these particular areas and, and, the, and those individuals who are able to fill those spots for you. And I, I think in all fairness to Gabe, uh, it was his first year at, at this level, and it's, it's an eye-opener. It's a, it's a real eye-opener for even those who are Phi Beta Kappas. Uh, and uh, you know, I I don't I don't know where you rank Gene Mock, and I don't know where you rank Dallas Green, and I don't know where you you rank the the likes of Joe Torre, <laughs> but uh, all of which had a great deal of success with a with a with a very the the ball clubs were very very different each one of those ball clubs and how things happen on the field because baseball while predictable and there's percentages we can use. But by the same time, if indeed we're going to recite at the end of the ball game, we looked wonderful and so and so did this and so and so did that. Quite obviously, the score doesn't show that, and that's the only thing that you really have left. It's a, no, you, no, you're, but, you're right, and 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 this is what's a little frustrating uh, about how I think Matt Clentak and and uh, and Gabe Kapler and maybe even Andy McPhail are looking at this season. I mean, I heard an interview that Kapler did a couple days ago, and he pointed out that, look, we improved by 14 games. We won 14 more games this season yeah. than we won last season. And then he brought about the, the, the issue, and it was a very good one. What if we didn't fade or implode at the end? What if we started out lousy and improved – throughout the season, but just came up short, then would people be complaining? But, Howie, you and I know Philadelphia, okay? The way I started this podcast was the surprising thing about this season is the bitter disappointment we have right now because nobody expected the Phillies there. But if you're going to show us that you have the ability to get there, well, then damn it, finish, finish. And, and, you know, welcome to Philadelphia, Mr. Clentac and Mr. McPhail and Mr. Kapler. Yeah, you right are on. going to be accountable here. I mean, you could reason your way a thousand and one days to Sunday on what happened here. But this yeah. is Philadelphia. And you got to put fannies in that, in the seats of that ballpark. And you know what? Average 26,000 attendance this year, all right? You know, that's a little bit up from the last couple of years, but it's nowhere around the 45 we'd have in there every, you know, every single night between 2007 and 2011. And if you want those fannies in the seats, then there's two things that have to happen. You better get one or two game-changer veterans that are going to attract the people to the park but you also better win games. Well, you're you're right on as far as, you know, the fan appeal. The the fans, uh, particularly in Philadelphia, and I've been in five or six other organizations, but Philadelphia Philadelphia has, over the lifetime of its entire entire, uh, life of baseball, has has always had the expectation of winning. And, And exactly when you go on the field, that's what they what the ball player's mentality is all about. And they should expect that. They should expect that we're not just going to participate this year. And I, I can recall when we got serious in the 70s, and this goes back, but when we got serious and uh, Paul Dallas and myself and Ruley Carpenter uh, got involved with this, uh, they, went, they weren't going to have anything else but those those players that were not only talented 
but uh, would respond in, in, in the kind of in the kind of manner that we expect them to, to respond. And when you look back in the middle 70s of the Philadelphia Phillies uh, and, and what happened prior to that and what happened after that, there has been a, a terrific uh, adjustment that the fans have had to make. And, uh, and it's made a difference. You, you can see it, you can see it in, the, in, the, in the seats, as you pointed out. But I, I, and, I, and, 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 this, and we, got, we got, I go back to, to the, the style and what they hope to be able to put out there. The, they, you still have to have talent to be able to, to play this game and be successful uh, for a period of time. Now, you have to have the kind of the talent that they're think, – think about this. How many teams are there, and all this baseball stuff is spread all around, how many are, are really, from the beginning of the season, are legitimate pennant winners and, and people that are going to contend? There's only a handful when you right. – those, those of us who, who look at this and understand maybe – and we don't have any, any secret, we, any, any magic to understand it. But uh, you can name the five, six, seven clubs, and pretty much you're going to hit. You're going to hit what's going to be playing in October. Now, that's that's no accident year after year, and it it comes from the continuity that's developed in that front office. And uh, I go back. I go back to uh, Gabe. Uh, you know the guys that brought him there. The guys, uh, you know, he's he's working for. Uh, but he also has to understand. I I believe this that he. he He's got he's got to know that heartbeat in that clubhouse, and he's got to be able to whatever talent he has, he has to be able to make that work. I I I I point to our our Kansas City club in '84 and '85, uh, and the names that we had. I think I think our our people in Philadelphia would shake their heads if you if you told them. Uh, in the middle of the season, that we were going to not only win the division, but the following year we had a chance to win the pennant. And then when we beat the Cardinals in that game back and forth out there in St. Louis, uh, with what we had, it, you, you would say, how did they do that? And uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that with every every ball club, there's a mixture that that manager he has to, he has to really manage, but he also has to. He has to know their heartbeat. Now, mm-hmm. you know, were the players happy with all this? I can't believe the players were happy with the way it turned out, obviously. And I would look for the, the coming season uh, to be pretty special in relationship not only to for the front office to take a look, as you pointed out, with those who might be in a regular position to play and those who, who they might try to move and try to acquire some talent to be able to – because if you – I mean, I go back to the system again. Look down, look down through the system. Do they have ball players in the single A, double A, and triple A to come there in the next two or three years? That's a question I ask of of the organization. I'll ask it openly, and uh, the the answer is maybe not. And so they better take a look. They better take a look at not only what we've looked at, but I even go back to the scouting. What are, what are we doing? Who are we taking? And how does this, all this work into the into the situation? And I I think a combination of analytics. I, I mean, we talked a lot about Gabriel. I think that and what they're doing, the analytics. Uh, we've always used numbers, Bill. We've always used numbers, and those numbers are as solid today as as they, they would have been, and they're going to be in the next five years. Now, does that make someone smarter than someone else if they understand all the numbers? You don't manage with numbers. You also gonna have to manage with your heart and your gut. And uh, I, I fear that uh, you know Gabe's, Gabe Gabe may, may have learned a, a real good lesson uh, this year. And uh, we know he's going to be back next year. We wish him all the best. Uh, and uh, I hope he gets the kind of uh, kind of help that, that he needs out of the front office and ownership. And because I know they want to win, I know they they want it to be successful in Philadelphia. Well, let's let's look just at the off season because um, we're running out of time here, and I, I'd like to tap your your thoughts um, about what what they have to do in the free agent market. The names that keep on surfacing are Manny Machado, who of course went to the Dodgers at the trading deadline after the 
Phillies refused to give up one of its top minor league pitchers. Uh, Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals. Now, Andy McPhail has already said, don't count on getting both. Um, Howie, if you had to choose one, and both have pluses and minuses, but both of these stars are game changers. There's no denying that fact. They will also be extremely expensive, commanding a contract of $300 million or more. So if you had to take one, who would you take, Howie, Harper or Machado? Well, you know, you, you really put me on the spot. The only thing I would say is I would, I would want to know the chemistry of my own ball club, and I would, I would ask myself which, which of those players with all their talent uh, would would help us the most, and and to find out more about both of, both of their makeups, what we what we see on a daily basis may not may not be what we really want in our clubhouse. And the other issue is how much money we expect to, to spend on this kind of a, a place. Uh, I think is another question. Uh, you know how much is how much is too much and. Uh, where do you have to, where do you have to go after that i i don't think i don't think you know from looking at their numbers and what what both of them can do either one seem, seems to be a pretty good mix as far as fitting in i think i think your first premise is we need a person like this or we need two people like this whether it be in the pitching area or whether it be behind the plate or whether it be that individual that can Play left field and get uh, the other guy down to first base. Uh, there's a lot of movement that they can make with some of the personnel they have to help that ball club. Uh, it, it pains a, an outfielder like myself over the years to watch uh, Hopkins have to go out there and, and uh, play left field. I mean, we we don't we don't look at how serious that really is and how it affects his psyche. I know he had the home runs he did and he led the club in so many things, but he's playing out of position. Uh, you've got the same situation in the infield uh, with the middle, and, uh, and, that, and you know what? That that is a serious concern. You know, you're you're, you're yeah. absolutely right, and and not just in the terms of where they're playing, but uh, Hoskins has really taken or has attempted to take uh, a high exposure role as a leader on the Absolutely. team. You could see it. I mean, starting pretty much in July, he started. To to try some leadership on the team. Now, you're talking about bringing Machado and Harper in. They're superstars. They're also very selfish. Um, the The club's going to revolve around Harper if they get him. I mean, there's no question about that. He's going to be the face of the organization. You're going to bump Hoskins right out of the picture. Machado, on the other hand, tends to coast. Once he puts up uh, numbers or something like that, he coasts. So I don't know how good either one of these guys are going to be for the clubhouse. You've got to start asking yourself, what did Washington win with Harper there all those years? You know, is there something, is there something to that? They didn't win anything. Exactly. Um, you know, so there, there's a concern about these guys. Now, well, on the other hand, uh, you look at what the starting pitching market is going to yield, and I – and you know me, Howie, um, I, I am going to go for somebody tried and true. And you have Cole Hamels out there who resurrected his career with the Cubs after the trading deadline. you got Jay Happ, who did even better, 7-0, and to help pitch the Yankees into the postseason. Both of these guys are former Phillies who Clintac could have acquired at the trading deadline, but for some unknown reason, he did not. And at the same time, the starting p- uh, pitching began to fade right at that deadline. Now, Clintac has said the most fickle market is starting pitchers. I get it. I get it. And maybe that that pans out with an analytical approach. But you know what? Like you were saying, if you know the heart of these people, if you if you put them in a different environment, or if you bring them back and they know – what it's like to win here. Don't you think that's going to make somewhat of a difference, a positive no, difference? No, you're, you're right on. And I, I think through the past hour that we've talked about the Phillies and, the, and what may or may not be the difficulties here, 
uh, you're, you're touching on something that's very critical. The people that make the, de- the decision to go into the free agent market have to have their finger really on the pulse of the club. And I, and I say that with all sincerity. And, and I'm not talking how much money we spend now or who, who, who might be a star uh, out there, that, uh, what they call stars today that fit on your club. But how is that individual, uh, what, is, what, is he, what would you do expect him to do? Uh, in the case of our pitching, uh, we need to shore up the pitching. I, mean, uh, I would expect that those starters that we named early on, uh, if, if we had one, maybe two that we could rely on, uh, do you have to spend a fortune? Not necessarily so, but the market is the market is very very high today for a lot of these guys, and uh, and I give a lot of credit to you know what baseball's done, and they're, I'm not a kind of person that says don't pay the players, but let's pay let's pay the guys that succeed, let's pay the guys that are truly doing the job on an everyday basis, and and get get a little bit back to that. Uh, reputation is one thing. Being able to perform is another. And as the season closed, closed this past year, I don't think we were looking at so much of that. And I think ownership needs to look at the talent that they have, who contributed what, and what ability may they have to contribute in the future. And be honest with themselves. Not only look at the numbers that they put up, but look at what happened to the club in the, in the stretch. And that, that goes to management. That goes to... That goes to the manager himself. And all those coaches that he brought along to work. Now, uh, they fired all the pitching coaches in the minor leagues. Does that, that does, does that tell the you? The hitting that, coaches. I'm sorry, the hitting coaches. Does that, yeah, does that, um, I does think that last, mean? yeah, oh, last, that? last week. Yeah. Last week, a bunch of them were sent. Yeah. Andy Tracy, his assistant, Frank Cacciatore, Sal Rende was let go, and John Miserock was let go. All those guys, and, and I know. Well, I know two of those fellows. I know Randy and Miserock very pretty, very well. They're good baseball people, and uh, someone takes a hit any time these things happen. But uh, there, I don't say this happened, but there, there may be other conversations in relationship to the, that kind of contribution. Now, after a while, you can move people around and do all that kind of business. But we'll get right back to where we started from, Bill. The player has to play. And the player has to, to feel confident where he's playing, that he's part of a team. And if you're not, if you don't have that attitude and you, you're not working in that direction, that doesn't mean you're a bad ball player. It just means you don't fit on this particular club. And mm-hmm. the other thing is, players first don't accept some of the things that go on or aren't comfortable because they're just their, their nature. That's up to the manager to be able to deal with that on a daily basis and to be able to pull them together as a, as a unit. And that's extremely important, and that, that break goes back to Gabe. And when you start to introduce what they did this year, something new, pretty much all these players uh, were not in Philadelphia the last three years or so, and so you're, you're looking at the trial and error. And, of course, the short of that first week when he really messed up as far as the press was concerned and did some things that didn't look right, uh, he straightened that out as he, as he went along. So you've got to give Gabe credit. For, for learning on the job as well. It's very, very important. So this year coming up is going to be an interesting based on what has happened and the kind of decisions that they're going to make. And Philadelphia fans, as you pointed out, uh, you know, what they basically do is they stay home or they won't go. And, uh, and that's not good. It's not good for baseball. The interesting part of all this today, there's, there's so many dollars setting up there for ownership they get they get just automatic. Twenty years ago, that didn't happen, and uh, so there's there's a lot of reason. However, even with the, if the attendance does slip and people don't get back aboard to support their Phillies, uh, that won't be a good thing. So that there's there's two things to watch in the off season. What's what's going to happen with this ball club as a whole? Not necessarily who's going to stand up and say, "Well, I helped them lose." It's not that, but it stands up can show that they've learned something this past year. And since that manager's going to come back, he's going to pay, pay a big price. And very early on, not only during the season, but in spring training, start the day one. And, uh, and, I, and in all fairness to Gabe, 
Uh, I'm sure he understands that, and I'm sure he's, he would prepare himself to do the do the very very best he can, and has learned this past year. But the points you've t- touched on the pitching, the hitting, but boy, let's let's improve some of our defense. We need to catch the ball, throw to the right bases, and uh, and run the bases uh, appropriately. Just to be able to stand up and say we just found this out in the last two weeks makes me wonder makes me wonder where the game has gone because it's more hitting home runs and throwing balls at 92 miles an hour. You've got right. to, you've got to play You're the right. game. And and uh, all the pennant winners I know when the Cardinals win, they win they win with the overall aspect. When the when we won in Kansas City in in, in 85 and did well in 84, yeah, we had Saberhagen and Gubaza, of course Gooby's from Philly and uh we did some things that, that opens a few eyes. When we won in Cincinnati, the nasty boys did what they did. But believe me, every every person on that team, including Lou, running the ball club, and Mrs. Shot, I give her a shout out. She's no longer with us, but that lady that lady loved loved her baseball and loved the fans and and did everything she could to give Lou the the, the lead way to do what he did. Just wouldn't believe, and your fans wouldn't believe to watch a grown manager come up in the office and after being ahead I mean we went wire to wire we never were out of first place and we'd get within a game or two of, of uh, someone catching us and he'd be up there looking for a left handed hitter to get to, to hit against the right handed pitcher in the eighth inning and, and of course you know he already had that but uh, you know what else could he ask for with the club so what I'm saying and, and you've hit, it, hit right on the, the main points of the difficulty with this this Philadelphia franchise this past year. Well, Howie, thank you. Um, as always, I learn an awful lot from from listening to you and and the experience that uh, that you have. And, uh, and and thanks for all your contributions to Philadelphia Phillies baseball. I mean, I, you were always a guy that that uh, you know were behind the scenes, but. Not many people know just how much of a strong impact you had on that 1980 team. Uh, and a lot of things wouldn't have happened. Dallas Green wouldn't have been the manager of that team if it wasn't for you. Uh, so I, I thank you for, for all that you've done. Uh, and we'll have to get you back at, uh, on here uh, again. All okay, and all the best to you and your fans. Thanks a lot, Howie. And thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. This is Bill Cachetis rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. This has been a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production.